thank you so much for coming along. We're really excited um, to welcome on board so many new schools this year for Young Tree Champions. And particularly the schools that have come on board have their applications were amazing. So much uh, passion and uh, excitement and engagement of pupils and wider community. So we are thrilled to welcome you on board and to have you sign up for our Speaking Up for Trees and Nature competition is so important to us. I have been to visit, I joined the Tree Council in August and I've been to visit a number of our schools. And one of the first things that the pupils share to me is their experience of the competition who have participated in previous years. It's a really memorable experience and it's something that pupils get a huge amount out of. So we really hope that your pupils get a huge amount out of it and we'll be sharing some more information with how the competition runs, how the workshops run. Um, and we really think, hope it leaves that lasting impression with you. So my name's Katie. I joined the Tree Council in August of last year. Before that, I worked in a secondary school um, and absolutely blown away by all of the amazing things that you guys are doing in your schools. Um, and we hope to be a part of that journey going forward. We really appreciate you sharing all of the wonderful activities, the ideas, the events, the planting that you have been doing in your school. And our motto is to be a force for nature. And that's what your young people are doing across the UK, um, really widely spread um, in all sorts of exciting ways. Um, and we ask that you do share those messages because we want more and more people to speak up for trees and nature and be a force for nature which is why we um, have the Young Tree Champions programme and why we do this competition. And you will be aware of many of the reasons that um, inspired us to run the Young Tree Champions because you will face them every day. You will see them every day in your schools and with your pupils. Um, it, originally, our programme came out of COVID where we saw a massive impact on young people's health and wellbeing. And a number of people of children reported to be playing outside for less than an hour a day. And we just absolutely see the value, and know you do too, in that outdoor education, that being in nature and the effect it has on well-being. Um, more information about the learning gap between um, disadvantaged pupils and their peers. And we're trying to work to target and tackle um, that in certain areas across the UK so that we can make sure we maximise the impact of our programme and we work in all schools in all areas in regardless of access to nature because we think nature should be a part of everybody's education and everybody's life regardless of where they're based and the opportunities available to them. So we're working a lot on that and I really want to thank all the schools who have taken part in our baseline assessment. That helps us to target our programme to the needs um, that are most evident. So that baseline assessment that many of you have done have shown us whether it is access to nature that your school is struggling with, whether it is connections to nature, whether it's information and learning around about trees and nature um, and, and what those needs are, where there might be a little bit of a, a lack of knowledge, where there might be a lot of knowledge, it's just so that we can target that approach. So if you've not yet done that baseline assessment, we'd really appreciate that information to help us make this program work for you as well as it possibly can do. And we've got some exciting news and it will be officially announced in all its glory at the beginning of May. But we have had two years of having Force for Nature festivals that have not taken place um, in person. They've been online and um, that image that you can see on the screen there is from one of our previous festivals. Um, and they took place online and they were attended by so many of our schools and amazing participation. But we're very excited this year that we are able to do an in-person live festival. And that will be taking place on June the 15th in Birmingham. We will be inviting some of our schools along, um, particularly those who are applying for beacon status. So at the end of your programme, your, your project that you've been implementing within your school this year, if you have um, provided the evidence of the connection, learning, care and share of your um, programme, then you can apply for beacon status. And so we will be awarding those and announcing those winners at the um, Force for Nature Expo on the 15th of June. But we, it will also be a really unique and exciting experience. It will be 
an immersive experience with performances and exhibitions and it will appeal to all of the senses and hopefully wow you and your pupils and we would love to invite the winners of our speaking up for trees and nature competition to that festival and um, we will arrange travel and transport and accommodation if needed and um, so that that winning speech that winning performance can be uh, performed and shared at the festival for us all to hear live so it's a really fantastic way to celebrate all of the amazing work that you are doing and will be doing over the coming weeks in school with your workshops and in some schools without but it gives you you guys have got that extra um helping hand with getting those winning entries in so the competition is officially going to launch tomorrow and that's going to launch to all of our schools and we will be sharing details on our web page along with the entry form and um, a lot of frequently asked questions and a lot of information. You will be taking part in workshops within your school. You have the added bonus of having Speakers Trust come to your school and support you through this workshop. And at the, the culmination of all this, it will end with one entry that you will enter into the competition and that will all be done with an online form and a cognito form in the same way that you applied for um, Young Tree Champions. You will enter your pupil your chosen entry in that way for our competition and like I said the winners will be announced at the end of May uh, beginning of June and we will then invite a winner to come to our festival our expo that will be taking place this year it will then we will have an online event the following week so anybody who couldn't attend can still share it with us and we will then go on tour around the UK with our Force of Nature Expo. And okay. um, so we will be sharing some more information on that soon with all the details, but it is very exciting. And we're looking forward to welcoming you all at some point over the coming months to that. So today we are going to, or I'm going to hand over to Jenny from the Speakers Trust, who is going to share some information about why we're doing Speaking Up for Trees and Nature, and um, why this RSC workshop, why, why does it matter? and share some information with you about what that workshop will entail, what the activities will be like, and um, any logistical things that might need to be considered, and what the next steps are for you. So I'll hand off to Jenny. Thank you so much, Katie. Um, hello, I can see a couple of you have got your cameras off. If it's possible for you to turn them on, that would be brilliant, because you're going to help me by participating in some of the activities that your young people will be doing when I come to your school to deliver your Speak Up for Trees workshop. You will get a Speakers Trust trainer, either like me, or um, we've got Gareth and Hilary and a few others who've all been trained to deliver this workshop. Uh, we've all been doing it now all for about three, maybe four years now, I think, actually. And I can honestly say that when we put it out to other trainers to be trained and, and see if they want to do it, uh, the competition is fierce because we talk very passionately about it. It's probably one of our favourite projects to work on, mainly because we get to work with young people um, and children and they are amazing. And as you probably know in your own roles uh, within your schools, young people are natural speakers. Uh, sometimes the difficulty is getting them to stop speaking <laughs> so that they can listen a little bit. And all we do is we come in and we do a massive interactive workshop with them to build up their confidence and um, to make them realise that they have all the tools they need already. And we just structure those and help them bring those things to life so that they can really bring out the best of their ideas and opinions within the workshop. So that's what it is. It's a real opportunity for children and young people to celebrate each other, applaud each other, build their confidence um, and realise that they have the ability and capacity to succeed when they try new things. So oracy is at the very centre of what we do. It's obviously a key functional skill. We believe that if children are given the opportunity to talk to each other and express their ideas verbally, it really increases their self-confidence, whether that's in small group situations, in partnerships or standing up in front of the whole class. It obviously enhances their speaking and their listening skills. To be a good speaker, you need to be a good listener. And we have a whole activity about listening um, as part of the workshop, as well as just about speaking, because it's really important that they can acknowledge each other's ideas and give each other feedback. And we can't do that unless we're listening properly. So that's quite important too. 
Um, we really think it's really positive for their mental health to be able to stand up and feel that they are heard and valued. And it really has a good impact on their self-identity to realize that their opinions matter and that adults and other people and peers in their group are interested in what they have to say. It's really great to be able to celebrate and articulate your thoughts and ideas. Sometimes they've got all these fantastic ideas and they're just a big jumble of ma magical thoughts in their head and they just need a bit of help structuring them to make an audience sit up and say, wow. And when they get that reaction then from the audience at the end of the day, they're so excited because they realize what an impact it has. And it really does have an impact. You can influence social change if you are a good public speaker and you can build that relationship with an audience. And children have got a really natural, innate ability to build that relationship. Uh, they just sometimes lack the self-belief and confidence in order to stand up and do it. So it's a really powerful tool for learning. Um, and that's what we're passionate about at Speakers Trust. It's the most important thing to us to make sure that young people, whatever their backgrounds, whatever their socioeconomic um, uh, background or their race or in ethnicity, gender, whatever kind of background they come from, that they are, they are able to stand up and speak and feel empowered and feel listened to. So that's kind of where we're coming from. And that's what we're bringing when we come to your school. It's a very, very positive day. So some of the things that we um, go through during the course of the day is working towards them speaking at the end of the day on their own, standing up in front of the rest of the class and delivering a speech. That speech is not prepared in advance by you or the class. Everything is done on the day in a really incremental and very cleverly designed way so that before they know it, they're speaking for about a minute and a half to two minutes at the end of a day, usually with no notes. Most of them feel empowered enough just to stand up and speak. Um, and they get to that point almost without realizing that they're getting to that point because the workshop is so well designed. There's so many opportunities to speak throughout the day that by the time they have to stand up in front of the class in their head, it's just another opportunity to speak. We don't build it to the point where this is a big deal at the end. It's just part of the workshop. So without realizing it, they've made this massive achievement and they have stood up and spoken in front of their classmates. So the strategies that we use, we start with the communication triangle, we go through the top tips for speaking and listening, we do impromptu speaking, which is just speaking on the spot, we uh, teach them a win feedback structure, um, how to listen and give feedback to each other and what they can do to improve their performances by learning from that feedback. We do a storytelling part of the workshop. So we think about anecdote and storytelling and painting pictures in people's heads to get your message across. Then we do planning the content of our speech. So we use um, a very, a really clever formula about how to put that speech together, an opening, three major points and a closing. And we get them to, um, we get them to develop strategies for memory so they can learn uh, what they're gonna say before they stand up and say it so they feel confident. Um, we get them to deliver their speech. Uh, and then at the end, then they realize that some of them will be selected to go forward. The competition is obviously a big part of what um, the Tree Council have partnered with us for. But in terms of the day, it's not the major focus of the day. We tend to find that young people, particularly at primary age, perform a lot better if we don't put that pressure on them. So although we will mention it, it won't be that big a deal. It will kind of happen towards the end of the day. And then the selection process happens on the day in partnership with the teacher in the room. So before we leave, we're all uh, decided on who's going to go through. So that's kind of how it works. And we're there to support you to do that, um, to make that selection, because we realise that can be quite difficult if you spend all day, every day with these kids and you have brilliant relationships with them. Your input is invaluable from that point of view. But also you have to then, you know, we get to leave and we leave you with these children. We don't really want to leave you in a position where 20 kids are going, why didn't you pick me, miss? So we're quite happy to take the responsibility of saying that the final selection is, is ours. And that kind of gives you a, a nicer place to work from after we've gone. So the first thing that you'll be looking for when the child stands up at the end of the day is how well they're using the communication triangle. So to build a speech, you need three things. You need content, which is just what goes into the speech. Delivery, so eye contact, body language, your voice, um, how do you make people laugh, 
How do you use a pause? How can you change the pitch of your voice so it suddenly becomes exciting or bring it right down so everybody's leaning in? So we play lots of games so they get used to the idea of delivery. And then we share a structure with them that really empowers them to be able to deliver that speech. So we take them through the content um, delivery and structure of the communication triangle at the beginning. And we do an activity around that. And then from there, we move on to introductions where we'll get all the children to stand up one at a time and introduce themselves. So we might say, just tell us your name. Um, just tell us one thing that you love about being outside. Tell us one thing that you don't really like that really annoys you. Most of them say they're siblings at that point. Um, and then tell us if you could change one thing about your school to make it more tree friendly, what would you change? So we usually ask them little questions like that and then we give them maybe 60 seconds or 90 seconds to prepare an answer. We don't let them overthink it too much and then we'll just get them to stand up one at a time and introduce themselves. And if the group are really low confidence, um, there are strategies for that. We might get them to pair off and interview each other and introduce each other instead of standing up. You will discover that the trainer that comes to your school will be really experienced and will be able to read the room within the first five minutes. And they usually plan the activities then on the hoof as we go through. So we know what the activities are. But there's flexibility within what we do and our approach in order, so in order for it to be inclusive. So the inclusivity comes from the fact that we're all very flexible and well trained. So we know what we, what we need to do on the day. So I'm going to get you to do your first activity. So this is an activity that I set the children. So there will be the top tips for public speaking. So these are all the different things that we think you should try and do when you stand up to speak, or we think we quite like to see when we're sitting in an audience. So I will then get the kids to say, well, it's quite hard to try and do all 10 when you're only going to speak for a minute and a half. So if you could only choose three of the top tips for speaking, I'd like you to choose three based on this. I'd like you to choose one that you would like to try and achieve by the end of today when you're standing up and speaking. I'd like you to choose one that you would like to see people do when you're sitting in the audience. So what do you think is important when you're listening to people? And then I'd like you to choose one that you think everybody should do, one that's really obvious that everybody should definitely be doing. So just like the kids, I'm going to give you 60 seconds to pick your three tips for public speaking. Then you're going to share them with the rest of the group. And the other thing I'd like you guys to do is, can you tell me why you chose those three? All right, your 60 seconds starts now. You're about halfway through. So if you want to use your reaction button or just give me a, a thumbs up when you've got your three, that'd be brilliant. Brilliant, I could see three little thumbs, four little thumbs. I think Helen's nearly there too. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, I'm going to stop that share so that we can all see each other. How fantastic. So who'd like to start? Um, Katie, are you playing? I certainly am. Do you know what, Katie? You can start then. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put, we'll okay. put you on the spot first. So can that you is no problem. Three tips? This is also a memory test now that I can't see the slide, so let's just see how that works. Um, so my first one um, that I would try is the pitch, pace, power and pause because it's alliterative and that's nice to say um but that's something that i would work on in terms of my presentation um, and my speaking skills um i would like to hear young people projecting their voices so i my background is in secondary education and i find that actually probably the uh self-conscious teenagers can sometimes be very quiet and mumbly and quite hard to hear so as an audience member i would like to hear voices projected and in terms of everybody I would like to hear them speaking from the heart because 
from visiting schools, the passion and the enthusiasm um, is really infectious from young people. And that's what I'd like them to get across in their speeches. Thank you, Katie. Marvellous. Give you a little round of applause there. Hi, thank you. Uh, Emma, can you tell us your top three tips? My top one is to keep to time because I talk too much <laughs> and I can go on and on for hours. My second one is eye contact because I like it when if people are looking at me, they're listening. And if I'm looking at them, I'm listening. Um, and my last one is being animated. And I'm, I've got the advantage of I'm in two schools. So I did this competition last year with one school. And I've got the trust coming in, working with my new school. Um, and some of the children's speeches, the content was amazing. But where they weren't animated, it wasn't very engaging. <laughs> Thank you very much, Emma. Helen, what have you got? So for my three, I would say um, structure your thoughts, because um, I always think that you can get lost in the speeches if you don't plan it out or at least structure it. Um, definitely project your voice, because I know in the children, um, they just mumble and I can't hear, so nobody else will hear. And the last one would be be animated, because it engages the audience, doesn't it? That's Fantastic. I... Thank you so much, Helen. Murray, what, what are your three? Oh, you're muted, Murray. It's class that's a classic Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. I was driving from school to here in case you wondered oh, why no, my no, <laughs> So I'm fine now, I'm fine now. Uh, so uh, definitely eye contact, very important. Uh, engages with the listener. Uh, I do a lot of uh, amateur dramatics. The number of kids that are all over the place. You want to engage so that people are listening. Uh, animation. You don't want to be monotoned, uh, and uh, and then and keeping time as well. Uh, some people, it's not just they talk too much; they might not talk enough. So if, yeah. if they've got a, a certain structure of time, they'll say, "Right, I'll slow down and I'll do my one and a half minutes," or I plan it out that I'm not going to talk for five minutes. So it's it's, it's a, that's a very tricky one. Is keeping in time. No, it's really so good it's, actually. People like, people often think keep to time is about stopping people but actually with children sometimes it can be let's try and fill that minute and a half because they yeah. over they've only practiced for 20 seconds so yeah i think that's really important okay rebecca what have you got uh i think mine was speaking from the heart because i know some of our kids at school do and when they do speak from the heart it really gets adults to really like believe what they're saying yeah. Um, I think another one um, was obviously time. Don't let it go on too long. Like keep people, you know, hooked in what you're saying. Um, and then I can't remember the third one because the screen went <laughs> off. Uh, but I'd probably just say, yeah, like maybe if they could use some animation or, you know, so it's not boring. I think it's about not getting people to turn off, isn't it? And like if they speak from the heart and if they speak through experience um it hooks people in doesn't it especially when the children talking about something so yeah. important that's brilliant thank you thank you so much guys i'm going to share the slides again so that we can all see them again now you're probably looking at them thinking oh i forgot about that one <laughs> i forgot about that one um i think that's great so when when the kids do this i i get them to choose those three um, and then one of the things I do is I put them then in little groups of three and then they have to have a debate with the other people in their group and they have to come up with a collective three. So they're already learning to kind of negotiate and think about what do we want to say as a collective three? What are we going to say? And then I get them to stand up in a group and present their top three tips. But I also always say to them, you can't just talk the talk, you have to walk the walk. So if you've picked project your voice, you have to show me what that looks like. If you've picked be animated, you have to show me what that looks like. So it gets them to kind of think more creatively about how they're going to present so they don't just stand up and go, oh, I've picked, blah, blah, blah. So I have to get, get them to kind of act out the tip as well, which is really important. Usually um, all the trainers are slightly different, but we've all, we've all got like a big box of tricks and lots of games and things. And I have story stones and story sticks. Um, I've, got a li I've got little kind of like stuffed owls and ducks and all kinds of stuff comes out in my workshop. Um, so I do lots of games with the kids about eye contact and speaking up and but constantly thinking about nature, thinking about trees, thinking about who we are. So one of the things that um, we're going to think about next is she's 
says, just going onto the other screen, is how we give each other feedback. So feedback's a really important part of the workshop because it shows uh, it shows the young people how to listen. Because if you're listening, then you can give feedbacks. And if you're not listening, you can't. And being able to kind of share the feedback with everybody is really important as well. So one of the things that we use at Speakers Trust is the win formula. It's very simple. The W is just wonderful. And we always start with what they did well. We always start with the wonderful because that's really important. And one of the things I will say to the kids is when you're giving a W, you can give as many as you like. So if you can think of 10 things that they're doing brilliantly, tell them the 10 things they're doing brilliantly. That's fantastic. The next one is the I, and that's an improve. Um, and even primary or secondary, I always say to the students, um, I only want you to pick one thing that you really think will improve their performance. And that's mainly because I find that if that people are very easy, I find it very easy to find the improvements and to criticize and, oh, that was a bit rubbish and you weren't very loud and you didn't, you looked at the floor all the time. And, and that can really be overwhelming for a child then because they think, oh, I've got 15 things to improve. I'm rubbish. I don't want to do it. I can't do it. Whereas if you say the one thing, one thing to focus on for the day, one thing that we'd like you to improve. So you just need to be a bit louder or it'd be great if you could just look at the audience a bit more. Then they've only got that one thing to focus on and it doesn't overwhelm them. And, and nine times out of 10, they hit that target and then they feel really great. And at the end, when we're giving them some feedback after their speeches, I'll have written down all the improvements and I can pick them out and say, oh, that thing you were told to improve. Wow, look at that, you've just done it. And that's that helps build them confidence. We want them to leave the day feeling like they've really achieved because standing up and speaking in front of an audience is terrifying. Most adults hate it. So to do it as a child, it, you can't underestimate that a child doesn't feel any better than an adult doing it. It can be really daunting. So it's all about making sure this experience isn't an experience that's gonna set them back five years by making them feel like I never wanna do that again. We want them to have an experience where they think next time they get asked to speak, they can remember that experience and go, yeah, I can do that. I know I can do it. And that's really good for their school life as well. And then the N is we just do what else did you notice that was nice or effective? So I usually have a bit of fun with that. And I say it can be anything. It can be the way they wiggle when they walk up to the stage. It can be a funny little thumbs up that they gave in their speech. It might be that they've got a brilliant smile or you think their haircut's fantastic or you love their trainers. It can be whatever you like, but let's just pay each other a compliment. So let's tell each other something that's wonderful, something that we need to improve and let's pay each other a compliment because compliments are important. It's good to make people feel good about themselves. It's positive. So that's kind of how I approach the feedback and the kids really love that, especially the notice because they go really over the top with the notice, which is brilliant. And sometimes they know, because they know each other really well, especially in a primary setting, they'll say really lovely things about each other's personality. So they'll say things like, you know, and she's really kind. And yesterday when I blah, blah, and they'll start telling you little stories about people. And that's great because that's all communication. That's all talking. And all I want them to do is talk as much as possible so that they feel really comfortable about talking in public. The next thing we do is, and we use the feedback when they do this, is we do speaking on the spot. So this is the most common form of speaking. We all do it every day in our lives. So the first thing I'll do is I'll ask the young people, can they give me some examples in their life where they have to speak without getting a chance to think about what they're gonna say? And lots of them say things like arguments, or they might say, oh, in school when a teacher asks you, or if someone asks you for directions, or when you're chatting with your friends, or you're trying to explain the rules of a game. Or And once they realise that they do this all the time, then I'll just say to them, right, we're just going to structure a little bit what you're doing. And the structure is very simple. It's position, explain, position. So this is what I think, or this is what I would do, or I feel, I believe, I would, and they state their position. Then they're going to explain, which is just the why. So I feel like trees are really important. And then they might say because, and that's the why. So they're going to explain. Um, and I will ask them for a minimum of two reasons why. And that's only because I'm trying to get them to talk for a bit longer than just say, because they're nice. I want them to kind of think about their reason. So try to push them a little bit and they get a big round of applause. If they give me more than two, um, they get a sticker. I always bring all these stickers with me and stuff. So two, two reasons why, if you give me more than two, you're gonna get something. 
And then they all want to give like three reasons or four reasons, or you'll get the one kid that'll give you 15 reasons. You'll have to say you'll have to stop now because it'll be lunchtime soon. And then at the end, they're going to restate their position. So they're going to say, and that's why I think, or and that's why I would. So you guys are going to do this now. You're going to do impromptu speaking. So just have a quick look at the slide because the bit at the top is really important as well for anybody if you're put on the spot speaking in life or at an interview or any situation. Don't start, don't answer the question until you're ready. So at the beginning, pause, take a breath, relax, think about the question, think about what you want to say, that's fine. If you need to, repeat the question. That buys you a little bit of time and it reminds your brain what it is you're trying to answer. Then once you've answered, commit to your answer. Try not to change your mind, let your brain fill in the gaps for you because there's a reason you chose to answer like that so let, let your brain <coughs> the gaps. and then conclude with purpose so we try and get the children to avoid saying in conclusion and we also try and get them to avoid saying so that's it at the end um, so instead we try and get them to think about their tone of voice if you slow down your tone of voice at the end of an answer everybody will know that you finished so you slow down and you drop your tone and everyone knows that's the end. So we try and get them to think about how their voice sounds and how they can how they can signal to an audience they're finished without saying, so that's it, I finished. Or in conclusion. All right, I've got some questions here. Delighted to hear. These are the questions that I'm, I usually ask the kids. So they're not too complicated, don't worry. <laughs> but I'm going to ask you each question. So I'm going to stop the sharing. And what I'd like the rest of you to do while the person's answering the question is I'd like you all to think of something wonderful that they're doing, one thing you think they might like to improve and something that's nice and lovely about them that you notice. So it could be Emma's fantastic skeleton. It can be anything you like <laughs> that you notice about them. Okay, so we're gonna go backwards this time, Rebecca, if you're there. We're gonna start with you if that's all right and give Katie a breather because she started the first time. So if you're there, that'd be brilliant. Right, nice and easy for you then. Rebecca, can you tell me how close to trees and nature do you feel? That's a good question. Um, I'm a forest school leader um, and I did my course last year and we've actually created our own forest school within our school grounds. So we have been planting lots of trees. And I think ever since I did my course, I've become so much closer to nature and everywhere I go now like I plan my weekends around going for walks and looking at different trees and I've got my own class and now they all love nature and they all want to protect nature because they see how how much I love it um, and they know how important trees are to the world um, and yeah and I think it's from my forest school class that I've become closer to nature and I've tried to pass that on to the children. Marvellous. Marvellous, <laughs> Rebecca. That's good. Very impressive. Well done. Well, that's why I'm so scruffy, because I've been in forest school today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I haven't got that excuse. I'm just naturally scruffy. <laughs> okay, Murray, I'm going to um, turn to you for a wonderful. Could you give me um, maybe something that you thought Rebecca did well? Think of those top tips. A, con a constant passion of everything she does and, and realising that, the course is just done is making a, an impact to ourselves not just for the kids yeah lovely she really spoke from the heart it was very believable yeah definitely Helen you're going to do the tricky one can you think of something that Rachel uh, that Rebecca could improve I mean just make one up for now it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, perhaps have an ending statement because it kind of Perhaps. Yeah, I think that's fair enough. Yeah, so yeah, a bit more structure. That's no problem. That's great. And Emma, can you tell me something that you noticed about Rebecca? I noticed you actually seemed excited. Um, but I think all forest school leaders are personally. Fantastic. <laughs> you very much. What lovely feedback, Rebecca. Very good. <laughs> okay, Murray, you're up next. Are you ready right. for your question? Your I'll, question I'll, I'll, is. Can you tell me why are trees good for your health and well-being? I think they're extremely uh, uh, good for the, the environment, yourself, the well-being of everybody. Uh, because I, I teach uh, sustainability. That's learning for sustainability is a big thing up in Scotland. So I, I teach that for majority of the year. And 
trees are the, the main focus throughout our whole school. From teaching from primary three, that you can actually split, split carbon dioxide into oxygen and carbon, and they can coat exactly for the stages of photosynthesis. The, uh, for the rest of the school that are planting trees, they realise they're not planting for themselves, they're planting for the future of the school. And the, their impact is nurturing the, the, the trees so the trees can nurture the, the pupils in the future. So I think they're extremely important for well-being for everyone, for future kids as well as the present kids. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Murray. Very good. All right, we're going to turn it around a little bit. So Emma, you can kick off this time with the wonderful. Can you tell me something Murray did that was wonderful, please? I could tell you loads. I like the facts and about the planting and that you talked about the impact. That was good. Yeah. yeah, facts are good, aren't they? It's really good. It's quite good to encourage the kids to put a couple of facts in there. And it also helps them bulk out their content if they're a bit worried about, oh, I'm not speaking for very long. We can always find some facts for them. Um, uh, Rebecca, you're going to do the improve because Helen had that task oh. last time. So <laughs> what do you think he could do a bit better? Um... Speak slowly. Because I'm <laughs> <laughs> don't help her. Don't help her. <laughs> No, I really, I really enjoyed it. It was like me. You could, you could see it was passion. Um, to improve, um, a bit more structure because I think in the middle you just repeated something twice. That oh, honestly, okay. that was so like you know. That was, <laughs> no, that's it was so don't, really don't good. I think improvements are always hard to it give. It is we're because just, we're just demonstrating. No one's going yeah, to do that personally. Don't worry. Problem. I'm not taking it to heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Helen, can you tell me what's nice and um, what do you notice about Murray? I thought when he spoke, he had a really friendly face and he was smiling a lot. And it made me want to listen. Thank you, Helen. Fantastic. Thank you very much. OK, Emma, your turn. Are you ready for your question? Your question is, this is quite a nice question. What is your favourite tree and why? Oak tree is my favourite tree. Out, I'm a forest school leader. I've been doing it a couple of years. And outside my woodlands, we've got an oak tree that's about 100 years old. And my nan would have been 100 years old. So we've named it Grandma Elsie Oak. And I particularly love this tree. Its branches wave in and out. It's quite cool. But I also like the fact that the, at the Queen's funeral, she had oak leaves in her coffin, in her flower arrangement in her coffin because it was a sign of love and strength. And it's a nice British natural tree. That's why I like oak trees. Thank you very much. That was lovely. <laughs> All right, Helen, you're going to do the wonderful this time. Can you tell us what was good about that, please? Uh, I liked that you put a story in there that you had, um, that you related to what your tree that you're near. That's what I liked. Yeah, the bit with your grandma and stuff. That was really yeah. nice. I love that. Murray, can you tell me what uh, Emma could improve? <laughs> You're just going to have to make one up. Just make it up. <laughs> uh, I, I, Emma, you were absolutely fantastic. So um, improvement. Uh, oh, the dodgy I don't know. Uh, though, it's washed out <laughs> from the rain. And we're, we're, yeah, I think like, you could have used if, the guitar. I'm very disappointed. Next that time wear a hat with, with oak leaves in it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and Rebecca what do you notice about Emma when she's speaking um again um a passion um she lo she clearly loves the job um and she knew straight away which tree she was going to choose and it, there was a background to that as well um and yeah brilliant thank you so much guys you're doing really well last one unless Katie do you want to do one I'm happy to listen okay. on this occasion. <laughs> so, Helen, last question then. I'm you. worried that the questions are getting tougher, you see, Jenny. So, <laughs> all right. Um, I've got uh, this. This is a this is one that the the kids actually really like because they've got a lot to say about where they go to school. So, we're going to try this one on you, Helen. What could your school do more to help the environment? Ooh. To help the environment, I think. For our school, we need to get outside more. Um, although I am the forest school leader in the school and I make sure every class has time outside, 
but I, mean? I don't think um, everybody else has the same vision as me. So I have to really, really rally it to get them all outside. Um, so that is what I think our school could do to improve. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good structure. Um, I was going to go to Rebecca for the wonderful, but I think she's had a little visitor in her room there. So Yes, I have. You're right. You have... I've had a little visitor. <laughs> You don't have to put your camera on, but would you like to tell Helen what she did that was wonderful, please? Uh, sorry, I got interrupted halfway <laughs> through that, so I'm trying to think of what she said. She um, said she's, she's a forest, a forest school leader as well, leader, isn't she? So she gets everyone outside as much as possible, but she's not convinced that the other staff make quite the effort she does. She'd like to get everyone outside a bit more. I think it's really hard um, because we do have staff um, with us going out into forest school and if they don't want to be outside, you can really tell. And I think it's really hard to try and get people to want to work outside because some people don't like the cold, they don't like getting wet, they don't like getting dirty, they don't like bugs. And I think it's quite hard to get people to want to go outside. I think what we're trying to do as a school is getting the teachers actually to come out with us and the staff and try and teach train them to facilitate more rather than being the teacher yeah. because we notice that a lot of adults we take outside just try and be a teacher rather than facilitate the children we, and we really try and say like get down with the children work with the children do problem solving with them like you don't have to be their teacher outside and I think it's a really hard thing to break um yeah it is it's it's it is it's quite it's quite hard to tell the teacher not to be a teacher with their class outside. So Especially... Murray, just moving back to Helen's performance, what would you tell Helen to improve? It's always me the improvement. <laughs> I could give some of the improvement. Emma, I can do it. This time. The right cat in, in the I'll background is really distracting me. <laughs> so next time, have it on your lap so it's part of it. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic idea. Yeah, bring the cat into the action. Perfect suggestion. Um, what about you, Murray? What would you uh, notice that's nice about Helen's performance? I like how uh, people in the background are getting involved in it as well. Uh, <laughs> but uh, fantastic here, do Helen. You look for you. I, I really like your hair in, in your background. Is that your garden in the back? I can see there as well. Yeah, so uh, fantastic. I think Helen, you used the structure really well. Actually, it was like it was a really good one to finish on because you actually used that position, explain position. It was a really good structure, which is really good. Um, one of the things that I should say is that when we come to do the workshop, it is our preference that we're outside. So if you are, because we're all quite outdoorsy. So if you are, uh, if you've got any space outside, rain or shine, we're quite happy to have the kids outside for the whole day. I, I mean, I usually keep them out even to deliver their speeches. I just love it all being outside because it's great. And also one of the things I do when I'm doing, um, when I'm thinking about the communication triangle, I usually send them off to find three things that they can use to represent content. So content is something interesting. So they have to go and find something interesting that they can talk about. Delivery, something strong that they can, um, that can symbolize delivery. So something that has, you know, makes, makes a good solid stance. And then structure, something that they could use to build something with. So they go off and find maybe a stick and a rock and a leaf or a flower, and then they have to come back and they build their own communication triangles in my workshop. And then they talk about their communication triangles. So that's one of the things I do. So one of the other things I do is, um, because we're all speaking up for trees, is um, it's really important that the children feel really centered. So I know you're all sitting down, I'm sitting down too, but we're gonna do th this anyway. So if we can put our hands together like this, fantastic. We're gonna stretch up with a nice breath in and then we're gonna open our arms out like the canopy of a tree. So like the branches of a tree. So we're gonna breathe in and stretch our arms up. And then open like the branches of a tree and breathe out. Lovely, and then we're gonna do that one more time. I'm going to breathe in, open like the branches of a tree. So at various points in the workshop, I'll stop and do little exercises like this just to kind of refocus and recenter them. Then the other thing I'll do is I'll get them to keep their arms out. So keep your arms out if you've got the space. And then we're going to make sure our feet are lovely and solid on the ground. And we're going to swing in the breeze. I want you to imagine that a gentle breeze is blowing. And then I'll say to the children, what kind, of, what kind of noise does that breeze make? And they'll all start making the noise of the breeze. 
And then I'll say, what kind of animals might live in your tree? And someone might shout out squirrel. And I said, okay, everybody be a squirrel. And then everyone will have to be a squirrel. So I do lots of things like that with them as well, so that we're constantly thinking about what are the benefits of having nature? What are the benefits of having trees on our planet, in our communities? They're not just pretty to look at. They are um, creatures' homes. They are habitats. They provide food. They, as Murray said earlier, they turn uh, carbon dioxide into oxygen. But there's loads of reasons. And once we start thinking about the things that live in trees or think about um, what it feels like to hug a tree, we do a bit of hug tree hugging, which I think is really nice as well. Um, listening. So that's another thing I do when we're doing our listening exercises. I might go and say, I want you to uh, go, go and explore. And then I'll say freeze and they'll they'll freeze in the, in the outdoor space. And then I'll get them to just, we're gonna listen for 30 seconds. And at the end of the 30 seconds, I want everybody to tell me at least one thing they could hear. And they'll come up with all kinds of things. They might say, oh, I could hear so-and-so's breathing or I could hear my heartbeat or I could, but it, it doesn't matter what they're hearing. It's just knowing that those moments of stillness and those moments of just being present in nature are really important. And they're really important for this workshop. So there's a real mix of very practical uh, speaking and practical getting the speech done. But also there's a lot of kind of games, a lot of activities, a lot of doing, which is, I think is really important. So the day goes really, really fast as well. It's just like whizzes by. One of the things that's really important then is telling stories. Um, Helen, when you were giving Emma her wonderful, one of the things you picked out was the fact that she mentioned her grandmother and that she mentioned that, that she made a connection to the thing that she was talking about. So storytelling is really important. And you can see on your screen now, the story builder that we use. Um, and we get the kids to all tell a story and the story must be based in nature. Now, depending on where we are, so the geography of the school or the socioeconomic background of the children or the demographic. So for some children, being outside will be their walk to school. For some children, being outside will be their local playground. For some children, it will be fantastic trips to, you know, Snowdonia with their families. It really depends where we are. And we will get that kind of information from the teachers before we approach the workshop because I think it's really important that it's tailored for the kids that are there and that no one feels alienated or excluded that's really important to me and one of the, the things I do is I demonstrate a story and depending on the group I'll tell a story that's either really simple about a time I was at a playground or I'll tell a story that's a little bit more um, kind of awe-inspiring about nature in a more grand way it really depends but what I'd like you guys to do is I'd like you in a minute to tell a story your story only needs to be about 60 seconds long. And what I'd like you to do is tell a story about a time that you were inspired by or moved by or made happy by something in nature or share a memory with us of a time where you were outside and you learned something or you experienced something. So it could be something as simple as a time you had a picnic and it was a wonderful time with your family and you remember it really clearly because there was a weeping willow and a babbling brook, or it could be something much grander. It could be a time that you did some rock climbing and you nearly fell off or anything you like, but just a story from when you were outside that you could share with a group of children. So think about the story from a child's perspective. And the last thing that I want you to think about is that your story must have a message at the end. So something that you can share with us that we can take away from your story, whether that's something really lighthearted, like, you know, the moral is don't eat yellow snow, or it could be something really <laughs> deep and meaningful about a relationship. You know, I, that, that was the day I realized that my dad wasn't just my dad. He was this epic superhero climber who could rescue people, you know, whatever it, the message is. And Katie, it'd be lovely to hear from you as well if you'd like to share a story. So take 60 seconds, just have a little think of your story. Start putting your little thumbs up, either virtual or real, when you're ready to share. Um, and then we'll just come back into the space and share. I'll leave the structure up there for the minute. I can see that Emma, thank you.
I'm just needed for two minutes. That's fine. And then I'll be back. Last. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, give me more time. I'm fine, yeah. I know your game. I know your game. <laughs> I'm just off to write a novel. I can see that, Katie. That's great. Helen, how are you doing? You ready? Fabulous. All right, let's come back into the space. I'll stop sharing that because it's just a bit nicer when we can all see each other in a, an easier way. Okay, I'm going to, Murray, you were the first to put your thumb up. So just based on that, this will be our running order. We'll go Murray, Emma, Katie, Helen, Rebecca. So if you just pick up when the next, when that person's finished, that'd be great. Let's listen to each other's stories. Off you go, Murray. Well, you're muted still. All right, easy <laughs> done. Yeah, when I first saw that, I thought, do I go fantasy or go truth? So I'm going to go truth because I think to, uh, truth might be an easier one to tell. So we went on a holiday with our family. So we've got my 19-year-old uh, and my 12-year-old. So we're going back about three or four years, uh, so they were a bit younger. And we decided we're, when we're in North Wales that we're going to go to Clandadno, uh, which is a place that I used to visit when I was younger. So I wanted them to experience exactly what I experienced and hoped it wouldn't be as run down as Scarborough, which I took in the year before. So we, we, we arrived the car, we, we went onto the pier, went on the beach and nothing really changed apart from it was a lot quieter. Excellent place to go. And I decided that we were going to go up the Great Orm. Now the Great Orm, for people who have never been to Clandad, no, it is a hill which at the top of it has got fantastic views all over Colwyn Bay a, and lots of different places. And when I was younger, I collected fossils and my poor parents had collected, had put them in the car and drove, drove home and they were laying their garden for 20 years. So I thought, I'm not going to go up with the train. It cost £10 each. I'm going to drive. Didn't notice the signs at the bottom of the hill. So we started fine. And then I suddenly realised that this hill was a one in 20 for every one metre forward, I was rising 20 metres. So I, I felt like I was rock climbing up this road, trying not to be stressed. Everyone else was stressed. And we got to the mine, which is halfway up. I relaxed and we, we went into the mine, which was an utterly amazing place to visit if you've never been, because it's it's got perfect acoustic for, 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 for singing and talking, which my, my younger daughter, my, my daughter really loved to hear. And it was nice to see uh, how the, the past was still getting used in the present for to understand about fossils and nature. I then continued up to the top where, where the fossils were, and lo and behold, there was lots of fossils for there for my children to collect. So to, to sum up the story, it is, it's nice to revisit places that you were in a child and for the, your, your next generation to experience exactly what you did and nature is an amazing thing. It can be millions of years old and it's relevant uh, today. But please remember to read the road signs. <laughs> Thank you, Murray. That was fantastic. It was really good. I've been to Llandudno, actually. They've got the toboggans, haven't they, that you can go down? Yeah. Yeah, I remember that. I remember that quite horrifically, actually. <laughs> I remember that. Um, okay. <laughs> I'm not very brave, really. So, um, Emma, please share your story with us. Okay, my story is about myself as a 14 year old girl, funnily enough, in Wales. I belonged to a youth club and we were going mountain climbing and we decided, our leader decided, we were going to climb Snowdon. And I was quite overweight. I was quite low in confidence as a 14 year old I thought okay I'll do this and it was a real struggle and we got to about halfway and a few people dropped out and I'm like well no I'm gonna keep doing this I'm gonna keep going and going and it was cold it was wet all our clothes were soaking wet going through the clouds and it took about six or seven hours of climbing some of it was quite sheer some of it was quite scary we'd done lots of practicing trying to prepare ourselves beforehand we'd done abseiling and climbing lessons beforehand so we should have been ready but no one prepares you for that cold temperature and I'd started to think oh, I wish I'd have stopped halfway at the lakes where everybody else was I wish I'd have stopped and all of a sudden when we got to the top all the clouds cleared and the view was absolutely incredible and I was so proud that I persevered and kept going 
when some of my friends stayed behind and being one of the larger girls, it was a real achievement that the fat one got to the top and the skinny ones didn't. <laughs> that sounds, but my moral of the story is just keep going and you'll seek the rewards. Lovely. Thank you, Emma. That was really good. Two lovely positive stories there. Um, Katie. So when I was younger, uh, primary school age, we spent a lot of our time outside of school and on weekends building dens. Um, we were lived in a housing estate that was surrounded by hedgerow and some trees and then onto fields. We were on the edge of a town. And so we'd spend quite a bit of time building dens. Um, and one particular spot where we built our den was underneath the climbing tree. Now, the climbing tree was actually two trees, one smaller tree, which was the one we climbed. Um, and it was it was just a social time. We kind of sat there and chatted and uh, messed about. And then one day I decided I was going to use the smaller tree to climb into the larger tree. And um, so I used that as a platform to climb onto the lowest branches of the taller tree. Um, and I made my way up and I spent most of my time climbing up focused on my feet and the people below me getting smaller and smaller. But when I got there, when I got as high as I dared go, because I wasn't super brave and adventurous, I realised that I could see beyond the hedgerows and across the fields to, it was late afternoon, so it was kind of quite an orange light, sun going down, and I could see in the distance a bird of prey just hovering above the fields. But for me, that felt like they were on my level. I felt I was as high as that bird of prey. And in that moment, I, like, I wasn't listening to any of the chatter and the gossip and whatever was going on down below me. I was just completely mesmerised. Um, I felt like I was part of kind of that bird's experience, that bird of prey's world in the canopy of this tree, which I probably wasn't anywhere near the canopy. But at the time, I felt like I was in the canopy of this tree. And so that was just a time that really sticks in my mind that I felt like I was really close, really connected to nature. Lovely, thank you so much. These are lovely stories. Helen. Um, right, so my story is a true story and the cat is coming. Um, <laughs> when I first passed my driving test, I took the car out and I went for a brilliant drive through the country roads and I ended up at a place called Sheepwash. It's called Codbeck now, but that's where I ended up. So I got out of the car, I was full of beans because I'd been driving, uh, I'd really enjoyed myself and I walked all the way through uh, around the reservoir and as I was walking around, the place absolutely floored me. Um, if you've never been before, it's like the Gruffalo Woods. The trees are absolutely enormous. The ground is really um, soft, so you can feel your footsteps all the way around. And it was so peaceful, so calming. It was amazing. There was nobody there. Um, it was a beautiful day. And I walked all the way around uh, and it was just gorgeous. And from then, uh, every time, whenever I needed to get out of the house or I had a stressful time or anything like that, or the kids were making me mad, I go to sheep wash for a calming walk and it just calms me right down. Lovely. Thank you so much. We all need a sheep wash near us, I think. <laughs> Rebecca. Uh, well, I was trying to think of a story. I was thinking, oh my God, where have I been? What stories have I been? So we went to, um, my girls don't really like walking. Um, so we took them to the Lake District one weekend and we stayed at the quiet site, um, which is on Lake Oldswater. And I said to them, right, we're going to walk to the waterfalls um, today. And they were like, so excited. Oh, yeah, great, man. We'll walk to the waterfalls. But I didn't tell them how long it was. Um, so it was one of them where, are we there yet? Are we there yet? So anyway, we got to the to the top. And I don't know whether any of you have done it. It's um, it's right at the top of Oldswater. And you literally, you just walk along the whole of Oldswater. And then as you go down, you get to the waterfalls so when we got there, it was four miles, a four mile walk. So when we got there, the kids were like, oh, please don't say that we're walking back again. And I was like, yeah, we're definitely, yeah, we, we need to walk back because we haven't got the car and that's the only thing we can do is walk back. Um, so they psyched themselves up. The youngest one was complaining all of the way. My feet hurt. Are we there yet? 
So we're walking through this field and she was lagging behind. And this farmer came past on a quad bike with his sheepdog on the back. And he'd said to her, oh, you not wanting to walk anymore as a joke. And she was like, no, I don't. And anyway, the next minute he drove into his field to obviously go see his sheep. And then the next minute we heard him shouting, help, help. And we seen him waving um, on the floor. So all, all four of us ran over. Um, anyway, his sheepdog was um, around him barking. So he tied his sheepdog up and my husband said, is the dog a friendly? And he was like, yeah, he's friendly. Anyway, he's laid on the floor in agony. And what had happened, the dog's lead had got caught um, on him and he'd been thrown off the quad bike and he'd landed on his ribs. And he was in agony. So I was like, oh, my goodness. I'd just done a first aid course before a school. And I was like, right, I've got my first aid kit in my bag. But I was, like, literally froze, like, oh, I don't know what to do. Like, what if he's punctured his lung? Um, so anyway, he gave me his phone and I phoned his wife. And his wife was recovering with COVID in bed. And she was a nurse. And we were like, oh, my goodness. You were literally in the middle of nowhere. And it was like, right, what are we going to do with this man? So we tried to get him on the quad. And my husband drove the quad bike, put the dog on the quad bike and rode him back to his farm. Then after that, the kids never moaned about their feet hurting. We just walked, we just walked back to our uh, gingerbread house that we booked. And we were just like, oh, my goodness, I can't believe like we probably just saved like someone's life if we hadn't have walked that way. And it was just we still talk about it now. It was just like one of them things that you think. Has that really just happened? <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, so that's what, yeah, we did. We saved a farmer. <laughs> Rebecca Tash, superhero family. Geocaching <laughs> is a great way to get children walking. Yes, geocaching My is. My own yeah. sons hated walking, but if we went out geocaching... What's geocaching? What is Seriously, that? it's like a little app you get on your phone and it tells yeah. you where the treasure is. And you go looking for this box and... Sometimes it's just a bit of paper that you write your name on and you sign to say you've found it. Right. But sometimes they have little things in that you swap. There's a website about it. Go and look oh, at I'm it. Look on now. You can do it completely free. But to the extent that eight years ago when I went to Kenya with school, I had to go and find a geocache just to say I'd found one on the oh, um, zero, on zero boundaries. Oh, wow. But to get children walking, geo Yeah, good is recommendation, the thing. Emma. Definitely gets kids walking. My boys used to love that. Oh, they brilliant. go for well, miles. <laughs> and if you give going... them an old phone, they go, 300 meters, 300 meters. Oh, it says it looks like a leaf. It's disguised. But we've been on trails where they look like snakes or camo boxes, all sorts. Oh, lovely. Well done. Your stories were fantastic. So storytelling is a really big part of the workshop. It's a really lovely part too, because most children really enjoy it. They enjoy telling a story because they know the story. They haven't had to prepare it or plan it or memorize it. So it's an opportunity to speak in public on a subject that they're very familiar with. And it doesn't matter to us what the story involves. We only have two rules really for storytelling. Um, well, I would say three, um, but more, the second rule is more for secondary because it doesn't happen very often in primary but first the first rule is that the story must be true so it doesn't have to be about them but they, it must have a basis in truth because we're trying to teach them to be themselves and speak from the heart and be authentic so they can't fictionalize when they're standing up because straight away they're just lying to the audience so it's important that it's true um sometimes in primary settings but definitely in secondary settings i always say to them tell a story that you're comfortable to tell to an audience make sure you're okay to stand up and tell this story. So, you know, you, you don't have to bear your soul. You don't have to make yourself vulnerable. You can just tell a story about nature, tell a story about, but um, if there are any safeguarding issues, it's usually in storytelling that they're highlighted. Sometimes children use storytelling as a way to share something that they've been finding difficult to share. And because they start off by telling their stories in small groups, with the adults in the room circulating before they share. Some children, especially in secondary settings, take the opportunity to maybe share something they've been worried about sharing. It hasn't happened to me in primary. Um, unfortunately, it happens to me in secondary at least once a week, which is sad, but it is the way it is, unfortunately. Um, and the third thing is that just the thing that I said to you, at the end, I try and encourage them to have a, a moral or the message of my story is, or the moral of my story is, because it gives them an anchor. So it gives them just something to work towards in their story. So again, we're trying to discourage them from doing that. So that's it. 
they're so finished. So we're trying to get them to kind of actually think about framing it, thinking about how do you finish so the audience know you're finished without you saying you're finished. So it's always about building in those little um, techniques. And then after they've told their story, they will be given an opportunity then to prepare their speech and we'll take them through some games and activities around um, topics and choosing their topic and how to frame that topic. But obviously for this, we are speaking up for trees, we are speaking out for nature. So I wouldn't say the topics are restrictive because I think within that there's loads of things you can talk about, but sometimes the kids think, does that mean I could just talk about trees? Um, and we sort of remind them of all the different things. So I usually do like a big group share. So I might do just a think pair share. So think of three things you think you could talk about, share that with the person next to you. Let's let's all share all the things that we think we could talk about. And then I'll get, I'll write it all up on the board or I'll I'll write it all down on a piece of paper. If I'm outside, I'll write it all down on my clipboard on a piece of paper so that they can come over and look at it and it helps them choose the thing that they might like to talk about. So they're really supported in terms of, um, preparing and choosing their topic. And then we'll take them through speech structure um, and how to put their speech together in a really simple, uh, brilliant way, which is really good, I think. And I think, is it Helen, you've already had your workshop. So you'll kind of understand how the structure works. We, we work with openings and closings and then three main points in the middle um, because it's easy for them to remember. There's not loads and loads of pressure to memorize. I think it's nice if they can try and at least memorize their beginning and their ending so at the start of their speech and at the end of their speech they're looking at the audience if they really need their book while they're up there that's fine but then I'll do a little I'll play some games with them about how you can sight read and still look up at the audience because what you want to avoid is them just standing there with their book in front of their face especially when they've done so well for the rest of it because the rest of this of the day they won't have used a book at all this is going to be the first time they really write anything um, and one of the things that I really encourage them to remember is it's not a written task in fact if they don't write anything if they just want to sit there and think about what they're going to say and then practice it with the person next to them I'm fine with that it doesn't really matter to me whether they write or not some kids loathe the idea of writing some girls predominantly little girls will sit down and write pages and pages and pages and then get themselves in a real panic because they can't memorize it I've written this lovely speech um, so I will just say well that's okay how can we break it down? Let's think about what you really want to say. And there's loads of strategies and we're really on hand to help with all of that. Um, and also the, the celebration is them standing up and speaking. So anyone that stands up and speaks in any way that they're comfortable to do so is a success in my book and will be applauded. That's absolutely fine. It, there's no pressure for them to perform in any particular way. We're not looking for any particular thing. We're just always focusing on that communication triangle. So we're always thinking about what's their content like? How was their delivery? What was the structure like? You know, are they hitting, are they hitting some of those marks? Brilliant. That's great. That's all we're looking for. And you get a hand in helping us judge, which is good. So I'm going to um, just very quickly share the last slide with you so that you can see it. So the judging criteria for the competition is um, content delivery and structure. Um, and there's a marking criteria. So you can mark them on 20 for, out of 20 for each out of a total of 60. So 20 for content, 20 for delivery, 20 for structure. Or you could, um, or you could just asterisk or write a little note next to the child's name. You don't have to score them. There's a score thing in the back of your teacher pack um, and if you want to use it, that's great. And that's the same with all the competitions we do. We get some teachers who love the kind of mathematical process. They think that's the fairest way to do it. We get other teachers who just make notes next to the child's name. You know, I loved that bit or I thought that was that had legs that could go somewhere or um, that was really brave when they told that story about, it. you know, that kind of thing. So it's really up to you as an individual and you'll be supported by the trainer. As I said at the beginning, we don't leave you in the lurch and make you choose the children. <laughs> Um, and, and then I'm going to stop sharing that so that I can show you something I think you might find interesting. So this is the, that's the score, the score ring that you can see there. And that's in your teacher pack, which looks like this. I'm sorry, I'm popping now. I might have to hand over to Katie in a second. <laughs> but let me just show you the workbook. So this is the workbook that the children get. And we provide all the resources and they're sent out to you by the tree council in advance. I think you get stickers and workbooks and the teacher pack that all comes in advance. Um, and I think that's kind of it. 
from my point of view in terms of the workshop. But we have got time for some questions and things. So I'm just going to mute while I cough and hand over to Katie for a second. Yeah, I was just going to say we will also give you five certificates. So what we suggest is that on the day you have five um, pupils who after they perform the speeches, you award a certificate and they um, have performed. Like Jenny says, it doesn't necessarily need to be that they have the highest score. You might find that there's one pupil who's normally extremely shy, extremely nervous and has really kind of pushed themselves come out of their shell. And whilst technically they might not have the most polished performance compared to others, they've come on so much that you want them to be one of your five finalists. So we suggest that on the day you award five certificates to five of your pupils. And then from there, you might have an assembly in school or you might invite them to speak in front of the entire year five or um, however you like to work it to whittle that five down to one pupil who you will enter for the speaking up competition, the national competition. And for that, you'll record them do it performing their speech and um, so record a video and upload that um, using the, the link on our website now that website link will that website will go live tomorrow so I'll share that with everybody um, and you can uh, nominate one of your pupils obviously it's completely up to you if you do not wish to or if the person who um, wins on yours doesn't want to be entered into the national competition doesn't want to record a video but somebody else does then you might um, share somebody else's video but we had some really inspiring videos that have been shared with us. Um, a lot of them that have, you know, worked on the their speaking up in the workshop and then have, have entered the competition. And on that website link that we're going to share tomorrow, there's some examples. We have different categories for the different age groups. Um, and there are examples of, of winning speeches that have been shared with us before. But it's just a really nice way to celebrate all of the amazing public speaking and oracy and speaking up that's happening in the workshops across the country to celebrate it on a national scale and like I said this year we are going to have our in-person live event that's going to be taking place and we would love to invite an overall winner to come and speak at that event and be part of a whole national event where everybody across the country can celebrate what they've done. Um, does anybody have any questions in terms of how the workshops work, anything further about speaking up, anything Young Tree Champions in general that you might need to ask? Um, I just or... have one other thing, one other bit of information that I need to share with you before I coughed my, my, my <laughs> lung up. Do you know what happened there? I think I took a breath the wrong way. So I know that some of you, so for example, Helen's had her workshop and I know Emma, you've done workshop uh, with a previous school um, and, and I'm, I'm sure that the rest of you have some information, but just a little reminder of the practicalities of what we need from you in order for you to participate. So we need a full day off timetable, up to 30 children, um, a contained outdoor space. It can be where you have your forest school. It can be a playing field. It could be a tennis court. It doesn't matter where it is. If we can work outside, that's great. If we absolutely can't work outside for whatever reason is happening in your school that day, then we need a classroom with all the tables pushed to one side and the chairs just set up in a circle or a horseshoe. Um, if possible, it'd be great to have some markers and a flip chart. Um, if you're inside, if I'm honest, if I'm outside, I don't need those things. And I don't think the other trainers would either. But one thing that I noticed over the last few years that we didn't mention in the first year, like four years ago, is uh, clipboards. Clipboards are really useful. So the very first time I went out with kids, we all just brought these little bits of paper out and they didn't have anything to lean on and they couldn't kind of participate properly. So yes, clipboards is always really useful. Um, and I think just from a practical point of view, that's it. They will, they will follow the timetable of the day and so will your trainer. So however your normal school day runs in terms of breaks, lunch, start time, finish time, you, your trainer will be in touch with you and ask you for those details and we will follow your school day. We don't require any special timings or special treatment. We'll just follow your school day, what works for you. Um, that's it pretty much. Uh, I think that's kind of the practicalities. My, uh, was, oh, sorry. sorry, go on. <laughs> My workshops, the Wednesday after the Easter holidays, obviously we break up on Friday. So I have emailed, I've got Teresa Dukes coming. Right. I have emailed her to say, do you want the names of the children first? How do you want it? And I've not heard anything back. OK, so, I mean, I can I can tell Alana that, that you haven't heard anything. Um, yeah, I'm sure that she will. It's only that it's Easter holidays and I do have 
other things to do over Easter. So you, do you break up this Friday? Yeah, we break up on Friday. Yeah, there, yeah there. She, should, she should have been in touch with you by now if you've... Um, yeah, I mean, general, I do tend to answer emails over Easter, but I've got, I've got like a wedding on and... I understand, yeah. School. Um, in general, what I would ask for, if I was the trainer, I would ask for just, um, obviously, just double check. I would ask for confirmation of your postcode, timings of the school day. Um, and then I would like an, a list of the first names of the kids that I'm going to be working with, because I tend to make them name badges. Yeah, I was going to say, is it helpful to give them a sticker with their name? Yeah, yeah. Or, or you can provide those stickers if you want. Because the I've children got I've got, got, I don't normally work with. Yeah. Because um, I'm in one day a week doing forest schools. Okay, so I, I think would want, I would want their first names. Obviously, for GDPR yeah. and safeguarding, we don't require their surnames. But yeah. on the day, I'd usually get the teacher to write the certificates because they have access to the registers, and that's fair enough. Um, the other thing is, I would always ask: Is there anyone in that group that's got any special educational needs? Because I like to know in advance because I've got an SEM background, and I like to be able to make sure that I'm prepped. So I know everybody's included in the workshop in the way they need to be. So that's the other thing I would want to know. But I will let Alana know that you haven't heard from Teresa yet. And I'm sure we can set those wheels. Yeah, in it's no major week. hassle. I just thought I might have done that. Yeah, no, I understand. I think it's better to get it done before the holidays. Yeah, I think Gareth, when he came to um, Helen's <clears throat> school, I think he came with a list of stickers and um, ready. So um, yeah. I think yeah. it would be useful, Emma, just in terms of you having some time to prepare things. If you do pull together that list of names, um, maybe with the, the initial of the surname, if you have two Layla's or two Jacob's yeah. or whatever, um, with the times of the school day and the full address, um, and we'll just make sure with that um, if for any reason Teresa's not available up until Friday we can share that with her but hopefully she will and hopefully she'll get in touch but just to give you a little bit of a, a planning time and time to get it done if you you just pull that together and that should cover everything I would imagine thank you Rebecca did you have a question yeah I was oh hang on oh I am unmuted um I was just going to ask because obviously I've got quite a lot of classes in the school and I don't know which one to pick um now some of the classes have already been out into forest school and already know the ethos of our forest school and they have the agreements and everything so I was going to pick a class that hasn't been out to forest school thinking that they've not really had the chance to be out with nature yet um so yeah I was just gonna ask advice like how did you pick the class I have I'm in a big school there's 310 children and it's juniors only yeah and I didn't go for year six because they've got sacks coming up and I didn't want to yeah. be ruined upon so I then picked out the year fives I thought the year threes aren't really old enough okay my advice from last year I had a year six girl win the speak up competition nationally and it was awful because she's then gone to secondary school and we've lost her so if you go for year fives you've got them for next year as a guide as well um yeah because that's what my head teacher said like don't pick year six because we're kind of losing them pick yeah, you a do. year group I mean, who we're gonna go up so she was thinking year four which yeah, obviously year, are going to be more four, than year five but I also I haven't got one whole class I've got children that have full permission for photographs to go on social media to go on the internet to go in the papers everything so that I haven't got to worry who I'm taking pictures of or not yeah yeah we've um, got, I know that um, Rosebrook in Stockton they did it I think it was last year and they used year four because when I went and visited them as year fives they had experienced it and they were you know super enthusiastic and kind of committed and inspired and but they had done it earlier in their journey so that it kind of engaged them as they went through the years and continued to work outdoors more and I know Helen you used had a split didn't you you had some year mainly year fives but some year sixes yeah. as well yeah so you could have, have a bit of a mixture if you wanted to right okay and then once the workshop's done is that is that it finished or do we just so or do you continue with well, once the workshop's done, in terms of what in terms of what you're doing for this, for Speak Up yeah. Trees, for Speak Up for Nature, the Young Tree Champions, you're going to then pick those five and they'll do it in an assembly or in a bigger way in the school so that it can be celebrated. And then you'll pick a child out of those five that you'll video and film them doing their speech. Right. And it will be uploaded 
to the website, but as Katie said as well, there's going to be a, a live in-person festival this year Wait, as well in June. And the other thing right, to mention okay. is, I know that um, a number of you have, who have joined Young Tree Champions this year have already start, talk, started talking about becoming a Beacon School. So to become a Beacon School um, in the uh, later on in this academic year, kind of May time normally, um, you will start to show evidence of what you've done in your project. So your connection to nature, learning about nature, caring about for nature and sharing. So a lot of schools will use their planting experience as evidence that they've connected with nature and their young people have connected with nature. Um, and they will, if you've taken part in the Speaking Up workshop, that's great evidence that you've shared that passion yeah. um, and message about the importance for trees and nature. Um, and then they will use kind of learning kind of uh, curriculum resources or workshops or forest school sessions for the learning section and um, kind of ro watering rotors and all sorts of you know what have been in place in terms of caring so this is also a really good piece of evidence um that can help you to get beacon status at the end of the year as well all uh, right because we're going for our green flag award at the minute and we've had to do lords for that as well we've got an eco club so i just wanted to pick, pick a class who haven't done anything like haven't been out i just wanted them to have part of like what we're doing in school so that's why i think i'm going to pick a class that I haven't been to forest school yeah, no, great idea. Wait to right. them. Okay, thank you very much. No worries. Anything you, else? You said, you, you said there's a live event. Obviously, it's quite far from, from Glasgow. But you, you said you were going to go on the road after that. We uh, are. Um, so are we're still putting the, we're still putting the uh, the route into place um, and still trying to confirm other venues. And um, we've confirmed Birmingham and we've confirmed London. Um, and we are looking at venues um including glasgow um is one of the venues um potentially also edinburgh um but we're definitely looking going to be visiting scotland um yes. to one if not two places we just need to to confirm that and get that in place we get super no excited and we um have all of these grand ideas and want to go everywhere <laughs> and then we but we need to logistically work out the practical yes. things of that. So we'll be in Scotland um at some point but we'll confirm dates and locations Excellent. Um, Thank when you. we can. Well if nobody has any more questions, if you do of course please feel free to drop us an email on schools at treecouncil.org.uk or um to myself or to Richard directly. Um, your speakers trust um people will be getting in touch with you um so you can obviously ask any questions workshop specific to them when you do get that email um but feel free if you've got any queries any concerns or anything like that just to drop us an email at tree council a big thank you to jenny who i know i before i even did this i watched a video of jenny doing um training with teachers <laughs> prior to this and um, for previous years of the competition and um, so as you know very experienced in delivering this and it's really useful to hear that practical experience of um putting this into place in school so thank you so much and thank you to you guys for um taking a day out of your curriculum time and taking people off timetable and finding outdoor spaces uh, to accommodate this but we really do think it's um it's a big plus for your pupils and we hope that it will really help them develop and engage with nature and share their love of trees as well Thank you. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks for sharing coming. your time. It means I hope to meet you all at some point. Thank you so much for coming. Come and Thank visit. <laughs> yeah. I say that every time, don't I? Kate? Emma, it's, it's going to happen. Sunshine Coast, Essex. Before this Thank you. school year ends, it'll happen. I know, but Thanks, they're coming guys. to my Thank new you, school. Becca. It's Thank my you. old school I want you to visit. I know, Rolf. <laughs> Rolf, we'll yeah. get there. We will. But I've got an Essex Forest <laughs> Practitioner meeting coming up, so I'm quite happy. <laughs> good. That is good. Nice to meet yeah. you guys. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you. Thanks, Emma. Thank, thank you, Helen. Helen. Bye. Bye, Helen. Bye, Emma. Yeah. We'll stop that recording. <laughs>